Test one, two in the cafe. Coming through loud and clear. Got sound here out here on the patio. One, two, one, two. Hello everybody, welcome to the Thursday Featured Artist Lecture Series with Liza Liu. Uh, we'll be starting our presentation in about 10 minutes, so if you have a seat in the hall, or if you'd like a seat in the hall, please make your way towards the meeting hall. Thank you.
Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the Thursday Featured Artist Lecture Series with Liza Liu. We'll be starting in about five minutes. So if you have a seat in the hall, or if you'd like a seat in the hall, please make your way over to the meeting hall. Thank you. A little dinner lunch. Hello everyone, we'll be starting our presentation in about two minutes. Last call for seats in the house, there are still a few seats available if you'd like to get a seat in there. If you are registered for a seat, please make your way over to the meeting hall. Thank you.
everyone. You can't hear me? It's on. Hi, hi everyone. Welcome. My name is Ann Cook and I'm a trustee of the ranch and it's my great pleasure to introduce today's feature artist, Liza Liu, whose groundbreaking works have inspired a new genre of artistic expression. Liza first became well known in 1996 with Kitchen, a life-size sculpture of a seemingly ordinary kitchen covered in entirely in tiny glass beads applied one by one with tweezers. The piece took over five years of solitary labor to complete, and ever since then, Liza has been an iconic example of human endurance. In an interview, Liza once said, I don't think you can separate meaning from how things are made. And if we do that, then what we do is negate the labor and the people that are a part of our process. I think my work is very much the story of how things are made. In 2005, Liza began a five-month project in South Africa that has now turned into a permanent studio space where she works alongside more than 25 Zulu bead artisans to create not only stunning work, but also a place of healing and community. Liza was born in New York City and now makes work in Los Angeles in South Africa. She's the recipient of the 2002 fellow, MacArthur Fellow and has exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and the L.A. County Museum, among others. This is her third visit, I had just heard, to the ranch, and we're delighted to have her back. But before turning over the microphone to Liza, I'd like to thank Toby Devin Lewis, the presenting sponsor, and others who are making the event possible, including the National Council sponsors, corporate media partners, and all of you who support the important mission of the ranch. Now, please join me in welcoming Liza Liu. Hi. Let me get organized here. Got lots to do. This is so wonderful to be here. I want to um, thank a few people, um, Sue Hofstetler and the Art Advisory Group, who invited me, and Nancy Wilhelms, and Ashley Toady, Mary Harvey, and Mara Evans, who organized things. And now I'm going to forget everybody else I meant to thank. So it'll come to me in the course of this. Um, yeah, so this is the first time I've given a, a slide talk in a really long time. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited. Um, one of the things I've done over the years when I'm asked to give a talk is rather than talking directly about my work, I've thought it was interesting to describe something more personal. So I've done readings and talked about um, sort of the under, undercurrent of my work. And, and, and I'm assuming that many of you don't know my work at all. So I'm going to just go from a, party, a starting point of zero. Um, let me just see if I have. One of the things that occurred to me in kind of preparing this slide lecture is what it is to stand up and give a talk about work you've made many years ago. This is, um, we're looking at Kitchen, which I made, I started when I was 20. Um, and it reminds me of a, of a Kay Ryan poem called, We're Building the Ship as We Sail It. She says, the first fear being drowning, the ship's first shape was a raft, which was hard to unflatten after that didn't happen. It's awkward to have to do one's planning in extremis in the early years. So hard to hide later, sleekening the hull, making things more gracious. And I guess I think, um, in a way, as years go by and 25 years have passed since I began this work, certainly there's hopefully been some sleekening of the hull. But nonetheless, um, there's many themes that this early piece um, uh, kind of, I, I sort of started an endeavor with this early work that, and themes that continue today. And I kind of want to talk about those um, before I get into showing you very much else. Um, let me see if I have... Uh, I guess I really think at the bottom of my work it's really about the blessing of the hand and the marathon of making. And when I started the kitchen I thought it would be a project that would take about three months. 
and I really underestimated it because it took me five years. Um, I made this work alone. Um, I started as a, as a painter and sort of um, began to use a material that was, you know, I, I sort of walked into a bead store as a painter and couldn't believe it. I really felt as though I'd, I'd landed on planet Mars. And um, in terms of the color and the luminosity, and it felt to me as though, as a fine artist, I could take this material and say something else. But themes that are in this work that I think continue for me are kind of this um, really thinking about the grid, um, repetition, obviously, certainly labor, and really thinking about, you know, how do you, how do you make a large-scale work? Um, how do you do that as a, as a kid, as a, as a really young person without any financial support? How do, how do you make something really large? And it became this kind of question in my mind. And, um, and the only way that I could learn that or know that or find the answers was in doing. So I really feel as though um, meaning can be made through making and that in the process of making work, um, you can find something. And the other thing about this piece that I guess is very important to talk about is um, really, you know, when you spend five years on something, what on earth, you know, goes through your mind for that long a period of time? And for me, it was really about um, celebrating women's work, this kind of idea that um, work that, li that perishes with the using, like washing dishes, scrubbing floors, this repetitive kind of quality. How do you, I kind of wanted to make a monument to labor that is unsung. So you see the dust balls and you see this permanently sparkling um, broom. On the side of the oven is an Emily Dickinson poem, which I think is another thing that um, I've carried with me in my work is just kind of um, poetry and, and, and literature is really, is really central to my practice and my thinking about work. And this Emily Dickinson poem, she says, um, she rose to his requirement, dropped the playthings of her life to take the honorable work of woman and of wife. If aught she missed in her new day of amplitude or awe, in pers first perspective wears away. It laid on mention as the sea develops pearl and weed, and only to himself is known the fathoms they abide. So I think what she was saying, or the way that I interpreted this poem and still interpret it, is that in a way, um, if you're a woman um, cleaning, sewing, mopping, scrubbing in the 19th century, and um, you're not given a voice, your, your beauty or your um, talent or your skill lays unmentioned as the sea develops pearl and weed, but only to himself, himself being the husband, um, knows the fathoms they abide. Well, I think you'd be really lucky if anyone knows the fathoms you abide. Um, I, 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 it's, and so in a way, I wanted to have this kind of sense of magnitude, the magnitude of, 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 of all of those women of history. And it's a theme in a certain way that, or a fascination, I guess you could say, that's, that's carried me through the kind of fascination about um, labor. And it's not just women's labor, and I think today the subject around um, women is, 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 become, is, is, is expanding and, and changing in really interesting ways. This is another early piece. It's the next thing I made after I made the kitchen. And it's called Backyard. It's 528 square feet. And talk about feeling like I need to sleep in the hall. Um, when I look at early work like this, it, it's, um, I have a lot of like, oh, God, really? Um, but I'm going <laughs> to talk about it because it does have um, things in it that, that continue to fascinate me. Um, I was kind of interested in, in breaking down nature by the, by the millimeter. Um, and this kind of false nature over-the-top kind of phallic flowers, um, I wanted to make a kind of orgasmic visual experience where when you look at something, it just keeps going on and on and on and on and doesn't stop. Um, a kind of very over-the-top aesthetic. Um, to make this work, um, when I had finished the kitchen, I had developed problems with my hands. I developed um, tendonitis, and I actually couldn't hold a pencil. I was, um, and I had to rethink the way that I was going to work. And I knew that I wanted to make um, a project that had uh, many, many of these blades of grass that you're seeing. Each blade of grass is a piece of wire that's threaded with um, nine or 11 beads. But uh, one human person couldn't do that in, in one lifetime. And um, I, I didn't really know that. Like most of my projects, I'm not very mathy. I just start and I get really inspired and excited and, and oh God, it took five years, damn it. Um, but, um, 
but once you have a start, you know, I started to have a show, you know, people had seen my work and now, now I was no longer this private person. So I was in a bar actually, because I always would just take stuff with me, you know, because you always have to be working, keeping your hands busy on a big project. And this friend was with me and, and, and he was like, oh, so, you know, he had like a stopwatch, can you imagine? And he goes, oh, so how long did that take you to make that blade of grass? You know, and he was like calculating it. And he told me that it would take me 40 years at the rate I was going just to make the grass. And it was just like, can I have another drink? So um, it led to um, this sort of thinking about how to make work and what does it mean to make work with other people and could I make work with others? And um, I ended up getting inspired by this kind of limitation. And um, I had a show lined up at the Santa Monica Museum. Uh, and I went to them and said, look, I've got this big problem making this thing. Do you think that I could do a community thing? And we, so they said, yeah, great, cool. And we invited the community for a period of a year. Um, we called them lawn parties. And people would just come in to the museum for that, over that period once a week on Saturdays and make blades of grass with me. And, um, so, and the grass became really, really interesting. And I guess I, I'm, I'm belaboring this early stuff because I'll have to go a little faster to get through a lot of these works. But I want to tell you about this because it's a central interest to me that I was really interested to see how it's carried over 20 years later into current work which is that if you take a really simple labor-intensive process and give it to people, like just give it to a lot of other people, they'll totally change it. You know, the, the human, like kind of, we get restless and we have to add a new little doohickey or do something. And so what happened was, if you see the tips of the grass, those little bubbles, the little small seeds at the top of them, and the grass became this magnificent thing. So the reason I sort of was saying when I looked at the piece and I look in the past and I want to sleek in the hall is because when I finished the piece, I really realized it was so much about the grass, that the grass was the story. The grass was so interesting. But meanwhile, you know, we only did workshops on Saturday, so the rest of the time I was making flowers and doing all the rest of it to make it. This I just had to show you um, because it's so central right now to right now to, I don't know if you guys are obsessed right now with the elections, but um, this is a really early project. I started when, um, I started it in 1996. Um, it appealed to me to do portraits of all the presidents because, you know, repetition, this idea of, you know, I'd make, made work kind of about the American dream in a way. And so I loved the idea of going through the US presidents almost like postage stamps. But what happened was, um, there was a bit of a, uh, when, when it kind of hung Chad, as you remember, when we didn't know who our president was and we had two months of not knowing, I thought, well, that's perfect. I can end there. Um, but now I'm kind of not so sure. I might keep going. But these are some close-ups of Jimmy. What interested me about this project is that um, to make someone look like themselves, you had to kind of exaggerate things a little bit um, and make these kind of caricatures. I made a painting of each a president, and then you're seeing the, the painting coming through the material. But it's, it's interesting because I did think about carrying it on, and my, my skills have changed, so it's, it's not easy to keep a project going for that long because you do change so much. So I, I did make a portrait of Obama. I don't have it here, but it ended up being a piece that stood on its own because I had changed so much. Um, it didn't match up. It was not cartoon-like. It was very, very realistic. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. That's funny. That was sort of, I guess it turned out to be, I guess I'm psychic, I don't know. But you remember what was going on around Clinton's election. And that just, to me, the cigar was a symbol of power. Um, this is another, pro this is called American Idol. It was thinking about um, the American dream as a kind of icon. Um, this is another American flag, it's woven. It, what it is, is it's exactly the dimensions of a US flag, only it's taking it into one narrow strip. And sometimes it can feel like that in America. This is another early work um, I did. Um, I Actually, this was a commission. I don't do commissions very often, but I did this. I got interested in um, uh, a couple in New York had asked me to do something for them. And I said, OK, well, send me your trash. So for a year, they sent me their trash. I'd get these giant UPS boxes that would arrive, and I would um, go, oh, God, what a downer, you know, because you'd think something fun would arrive, and it'd be people's trash. But um, I basically enshrined their trash, and it became a portrait of their marriage and their family and their lives. They even sent me a, I think this is kind of weird, but they sent me a vibrator. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I sent that back. I don't know. I didn't feel comfortable. But um, this is another uh, project I did. It's called Trailer. 
It's uh, a 40-foot long Spartan mobile mansion, um, which I, I got in the Mojave Desert and um, brought to my place, dragged it out to where I live and work. And then I gutted the interior. And I, what I wanted to do was really um, um, break down all the color that was associated with my work and break it down into black and white. I started to think, what happens when you take away the color? Interestingly, someone saw the piece and they had this big argument with me like a year later, like, that had color in it. You had color in that. So they, you can mem remember something as color, but it's completely grays and whites. And again, you see a grid that's happening on the floor. There's always a kind of this Archwager wood grain that I've been interested in for a long time. I was describing a kind of film noir. You can enter this piece. There's sound. You, when you enter it, it's very, very eerie. And I have to say, just showing slides, that it's, it is sort of a drag because so much of my work is experiential. Um, it's a feeling that you have when you stand in front of something that can fill your whole body. You're standing inside something that's got this kind of labor that you could associate with um, uh, maybe what I aspire to is a kind of feeling of a kind of chapel-like embrace that you're inside a world that's completely of itself. So I was trying to sort of describe a man's world through objects. And I thought about Don DeLillo. He has this... Um, this um, quote in White Noise where he talks about, he says something like, why do possessions carry so such sorrowful labor? They carry a foreboding. And I think I tried to do that. I tried to set up a scene where you would try to piece together what's happened, what went wrong by what's there. Um, and it was actually kind of fun, I have to say, researching that. There's my guitar. But working on this project, I worked, um, I made this work in LA and my studio is all these works that I've shown you so far. Um, and after making the kitchen, I was really blessed because um, the kitchen was, um, uh, people seemed to like it. And so I started to actually have a career and um, I was able to start to show my work and, um, and have assistance. And which made a really big difference. So I worked in my LA studio with, a, in a, I think, about um, four or five people to make this work. And this, in the end, I realized I needed a body. That the objects weren't enough. So um, I need, it, it, it sort of ended up having this thing. There's a soundtrack in the work as well. Um, after that, I get, I um, after making the trailer, I started to. Um, you know, I have a background in um, in the fa in a faith. My family, uh, I grew up in the church um, with born again Christians, and so today I'm not going to sing gospel songs to you. But last time I was here, I did that. I just got up and s testified, and I was I think that was about the time that I was last here, um, around 2004. Um, but I, I started to really think about the undercurrent of my work, which is really faith, about um, seeing things that you can't see, the unseen world of faith, that in a way for me, though I, it's not where I'm at now, um, influenced me as an artist to think about deeper things. I mean, there's, there's good and bad to everything, and the good that I found in, in my upbringing around faith was mm -hmm. one of always looking at objects and looking for the miracle in it, or looking for the demons in it or the angels, or the saints. So this, is particular, this next little suite of works is related to my personal narrative. And I did a film about it. You can actually, if you're interested, I have it online on my website. Because um, it's kind of, um, it's, a, it's a narrative that's about my childhood. And I felt like it was important to say. Um, this is um, inspired by a Kafka um, uh, quote where he said, art is the ax that breaks the frozen sea within us. I liked it that the axe is made of the wood that's chopping it. You're chopping down something with the thing that it's made of. This is another um, series that I kind of did about kind of thinking about signs and wonders. I guess it's kind of getting a little dystopic here. Um, this is again to do with my narrative, so you'll have to watch it if you want to know what it's about. Um, this is um, called The Damned, and it's, it's based on Masaccio's um, piece, The Damned. It's about eight feet tall. I was thinking about this kind of valor of shame. Um, they're in this total agony, and yet their bodies are, are resplendent. I often think we don't know our own state of shame, or uh, um, certainly if you come from any kind of faith base, usually there is a bit of shame involved. Um, and yet, um, there's this kind of perfectionism. 
I guess one of the things I guess I have to talk about also in this work is how interested I am in in the in the, the in the kind of classicism in what happens with this material in the direction that you have this way of sculpting with a material that's three dimensional. Um, that piece was called the vessel, and it was sort of a, a to me kind of like a bowl with the, the inside of the neck. Um, of this kind of Christ-like figure is open for you to project your fantasies or dreams or beliefs onto. Um, and there's the wood grain again, and also this kind of interested in classical drapery. Um, that's kind of been an ongoing fascination. And this is taking that further. I did a series of these blankets. Um, started to really think about how central um, ideas about religion and faith are in America. So I, I, I see myself very strongly as an American artist um, that my work, I think I grew up with. And then watching over the years as you become more conscious, the, a little bit of the underside of things. Um, this is called Scaffold. There we go with wood grain again. Kind of, you know, the nooks and crannies of spending months and months and months with tweezers applying um, this material. Um, I, guess, I guess looking at it now, I can only say that how much I care about really the way things do look. And I, I know that's not a very popular thing, that you know, how something looks is almost sometimes secondary. But for me, it's really important, even if it's something like this, which is called Stairway to Heaven, um, and certainly has a d dark side, um, kind of d dark humor to it, I still really care about about that bucket. Um, there's there's inscription that you can't see, which is a warning label that's that's um, written in in beads. But I guess there's certain things started to happen that um, that I'm going to tell you about um, in my work, uh, which was that it was really strange to me as someone who had spent you know really nine years the kitchen and the backyard together. It's a nine year period of time, really without having a mainstream type of art career. I mean, I came out of nowhere. I made my kitchen. Um, without, um, I didn't you know, go to art school, I left school, so I didn't have a, a, a community of peers or professors or even really artist friends to kind of cheer me on. If anything, people were pretty, pretty horrified. Um, so it was really odd to me when I started to have a, a kind of career and, and had gallery shows. I reached a kind of, um, I think I kind of started to reach a kind of crisis of meaning around what it meant to make work where it might just go into a collector's home never to be seen again. Um, because you can't control where your work is seen or if it will be seen in a museum, which of course is what all artists want. They want their work to be seen, appreciated, and they want it to be for free for everyone. Um, and so as someone who cares deeply about all of that, you start to think, okay, what does this all mean? Um, what does it mean to be making these things? Um, and I think this piece is called, it's called Barricade, and this kind of little, speaks a little bit about that. It's about this kind of idea about um, enclosure or a fence or a barrier that actually protects you not at all. So it's a kind of poetic um, uh, wall that doesn't protect you. And um, this is uh, a, a work called, um, it's, it's self-portrait actually, it's about this kind of effacement. It's called Face Down, and it's my face imprinted into a, a pillow. This is called Cell, so now things I guess have gotten, um, you know, now I was really thinking about the American landscape and thinking about how, um, how prison cells are, um, are ubiquitous, are, are, are commonplace, something like two million Americans are incarcerated, um, so it's safe to, to, I think, to say or to, to make this um, a, another iconic American symbol or image that, that we don't look at or think about a lot, but it's, it's certainly real. Um, and also I got very interested, aside from that big story, because you know you might have a big story around what you're doing, and then as you get into making it, it takes on another world. So the other side of it was really about serving time, which I certainly think about in my own work, my own practice, which is about this very, very, very slow, methodical process of applying beads with the tweezers. And so I started to really think about how that making was really, really important and how I actually wanted to slow it down, if you can imagine. Um, but I wanted to make it slower because we were doing time. Um, so what, what we were doing here is taking the material and making the holes face up, and each brick became a kind of painting. And I started to see, God, you know, 
how come it can't just be the bricks? And this was the floor. So I wanted the floors to kind of be a kind of like a concrete, you know, abstract pattern. But when I finished the work, I really saw that, that was a painting. And um, has a light in it, as you can see. Ceiling has got materials as well. It's covered. So I had kind of reached this sort of crisis about making in the sense that um, I was starting to think about, about, you know, does it matter how something is made? I've always argued, because people early on would say, oh my God, you spent five years on that? That's crazy, that's incredible. And I would always say, well, you could spend 20 years on something and it doesn't make it good. So it, could, it doesn't really matter. And, and a lot of the work that I love most actually doesn't take a long time. I don't think that that, that justifies anything. But I've ne I always kind of downplayed or tried to kind of just not make that the whole story of my work because, hey, what I do is my own business in the studio and then once it goes out and you see it, then you see it. So, so what? But, but I kind of started to rethink that a little bit here, at the, right around this, this time of making this work. I started to think, well, I mean, I had a studio full of assistants working and they were all really great, but I started to think, you know, I'm, I'm, God, you know, I'm going to have a gallery show and that's great and I'm really lucky and really blessed, but, you know, I just kind of started to feel this kind of, um, kind of urge to, to see if I could make work in a way that where the making of the work could be just as, as juicy in a really big way as the actual finished work. So I got this brainwave to make uh, a security fence. And um, I had this thought, and it, what I would do is fabricate, and what you can see is just kind of a standard, um, uh, um, what do you call that stuff? Gosh, chain link, thank you. Um, chain like material, what would happen? Is it humanly possible? Because this gets me really excited. Is it humanly possible to do it? So if it doesn't seem like it is, then I get really like, yes, okay, that's for sure. We've got to do this. I've got to try. Um, to, to actually wrap beads around a chain link enclosure. And then I started to think, well, Scott, I work with a craft metier. I work with this material. You know, could I make a difference somewhere? Could I go somewhere um, in, a, in another country maybe or somewhere where people actually work with beads as their central interest, their central creative interest? Because in the past, I've just trained people who aren't necessarily interested in the material at all. So I started to write letters. And I wrote letters to this nonprofit group and told them who I was and what I wanted to do and just said, hey, I'm this artist, I've got this idea, can I, can I be of service, can I help? And they said, yeah, you should go to South Africa. Um, the HIV epidemic was at its peak. It was um, the, the epicenter of the HIV, ep HIV epidemic was in KwaZulu-Natal. And they said, you know, you should really think about going there. Unemployment is up to 70% in the townships. And yes, these are people who have, this is Zulu women who have a central interest in this material. So I loaded myself onto a plane. I packed up my um, chain link fence, as you can see. And I rolled on over to Durban, South Africa. And I... Um, I started with a group of 12 women who were previously unemployed, had history of, of beadwork in their, in their bones, in their blood, grandmothers, mothers, but not working in the way that I work, which was with glue. And um, within minutes of being there, the women began to sing gospel songs. And for me, that was like a homecoming. Um, I realized I'd traveled 3,000 miles to end up back in the place where I'd started in some really deep and profound way. And I, I also knew that it might be really difficult to ever, to ever leave because I found my kindred spirits. I found women who loved this process as much as I do. And, and I was able to make art in a, such an interesting way and we were able to do something big. And at the same time, their lives were, I was watching them also kind of sleekening their halls, as it were, you know. Um, and that wasn't because of me, it was just because they had a job. So, um, you know, an impossible task might be applying beads to razor wire. Um, it turns out in South Africa, this, this, this image is iconic. This is everywhere there. But, um, but for me, the starting point was all about America, and it turned out to be bigger. And I think that's what happens in any process. As you start something, you start to find out all these other resonances. And this was the finished um, security fence. It's about eight feet tall. It's, um, this was another project continuing on um, in South Africa. Um, it's called Continuous Mile. It's one continuous piece of rope that's woven and then um, 
just um, coiled together to hold into one shape. This is another project. Um, is, again, kind of just thinking about enclosure in some interesting way, um, and process, and labor, and repetition, all these things that kind of have interested me and engaged me. This is a kind of a close-up of these chains. This is a project that um, has only been seen once. It's called Maximum Security. It was um, seen in New York at um, Lever House a long time ago, in like 2008, I think. Um, but I was really excited about it because it's, um, it's got this thing of repulsion and pleasure mixed into it, and, and I'm sort of really interested in that. This is based on, um, on prison architecture, where there's a central uh, break area, and then there are the, the death row prison cells are on all sides. Um, but aside from that, I get really interested in, in, the, in the wonder of something, in this kind of pleasure of looking. Peter Sheldahl has this really great quote where he says something like, um, art teaches us to rehearse for anything that matters, that looking at art kind of is a rehearsal to looking at anything in life. And I think um, I am interested in, in sort of having a sense of wonder, even though the subject matter might be something kind of dark. But this was my great pleasure, the moment of seeing all of those chain links, um, this kind of moire effect, which I think also is kind of, kind of centrally has been kind of interesting to me. Well, as I was working on that, I kind of got interested in this idea of maybe hopping off the three dimension and thinking about bringing it down to two dimensions. What this is is actually, um, it's prison orange. It's called conditions of capture. And the beads are uh, balanced on their tips to make the whole. Um, it's, this very is really, again, slowing down time, making something that's slow even more slow, which sounds perverse, but I think when you're making art, you shouldn't be interested in getting her done. I think you should be interested in the process, because if you're not having fun in the process, then you're completely missing the point. And I think that's my practice in South Africa, which is really about the pleasure of making. And, um, you know, Duchamp said, have fun, otherwise you'll bore us. And I think, um, I think fun has meaning. Fun um, doesn't isn't really mean um, stupid fun, but kind of the pleasure of doing something, being with the people that you like, um, it, it ends up becoming so, so, so important. So what you're seeing here is we're balancing the beads on their tips one at a time with the tweezers on a pre-painted frame. And these beads are different heights. So um, this was... Um, kind of continuing on with work that I was making where I really had a specific um, outcome or I had a specific thing that I was going toward. Um, this is uh, uh, based on a, uh, a prayer rug. And so the prayer rug is starting to kind of devolve a little bit. Um, but I was looking at Afghan prayer rugs and thinking about prayer and, again, faith. Um, but as I was in South Africa, um, experiences of being there started to make me realize that, that my idea of perfection or these hard objects, these hard, shiny objects, were starting to kind of, um, maybe I wasn't listening to the environment. So things started to kind of devolve a little bit. And what you're seeing here is the, um, I would have the team make these very regimented areas and then I would go in and almost like a painter be sort of making these abstractions, these incursions. And also I think I was a bit homesick, so it became a map, a sort of, way to try and get home. And this is a, a, another one where you see this sort of city happening. So I guess around that time, um, when I started to really see that, that maybe it was about listening more to the women that I work with, um, I started to think about, you know, there were taxi strikes and, and, and things going on that made it really difficult for, for women to get into the studio. So I wanted to start to develop a practice where people could work at home. And so this is an image working in the township on a project called, um, gosh, am I going to, uh, this is called The Book of Days. And it's 365 woven sheets like this, which are stacked. And what I really was interested in here was this kind of, it occurs to me in working on labor-intensive work how, how, how much, again, back to the kitchen, this idea of, of labor that's forgotten in the using, in the making, that you can never appreciate really labor. You can only ever really maybe get a glimmer of it or the outsides or the edges. And I love that each sheet was so lovingly made, and yet all you're going to see for it is the stack, is the edges. And each one truly is a painting. 
So you see this kind of painting occur on the edges. And I, my, I guess I started to see that my practice was more and more going to be about listening to that kind of um, occurrence, watching for where those places could happen. Less about my will, less about, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a, you know, a security fence. Or more about what happens if we, if we weave something in a repetitive color. Where, where does the hand start to come in and take over in the way that it did with the grass in the backyard, where the grass suddenly became this other thing? This was a show that I did in Los Angeles where I, I started to really think about um, painting and sort of taking on um, this idea that I'm not a painter technically, I'm working with something three-dimensional that comes three-dimensional, but stretching it across stretcher bars. This was made during a time of the economic collapse, and what it is is it's a, a, a dollar bill. It's, it's little um, golden squares that are um, based on the, square f the, the measurements of a dollar bill and then stacked to the tipping point where if you put one more on, it would collapse. And it's not that high, actually. It's about waist high. This is um, called hold. And I guess I started to really think about work as a container for so much, um, for suffering, for joy, a kind of holding. But of course it has holes. It, it's a sieve in the end. These are other um, works. And you kind of see this continued fascination with the grid. And so taking it off the frame is a door. It's called Seek Knock. Find, which is, this is another stack because it's one million, we actually worked out how many beads were actually in that stack. This was a, um, a kind of a, a beginning of thinking about the material, uh, thinking about what, what I do as a kind of healing that in a way I was sort of healing the canvas. So the canvas was woven and then I cut it apart and, and, and sewed it back together with this kind of golden thread. This is another work kind of thinking about, just thinking about, um, you know, taking something that's perfect, tearing it apart, piecing it back together. What really interests me here are the amount of striations that you see, the amount of variation you see. This is an identical um, bead that's uh, made in a factory, and yet it has so many variations. Let's see if I can go. And this is this, um, this show. And again, kind of thinking about painting, taking the painting off the frame. Continuing this kind of inquiry. I guess one of the things that happened making this work, this is, this is an interesting title, it's called Almost Wonderful. And I guess I was kind of responding to um, a friend of mine who's a writer who somebody critiqued her work and said, well, you know, it's almost wonderful. So kind of no matter how hard you try, it can be, this is 24 karat gold um, bead and um, even if it's made of something precious, even if it was made really well, you know, it's not that good. It's <laughs> almost wonderful. Um, I, it's one of the things about South Africa is it's on the Indian Ocean, so um, I think a lot about the waves, and I think that that landscape is, is really inspiring. This is um, a piece where we, um, I, I guess part of my, my, my job, I feel like, in the studio is sort of commissioning something repetitive and then sometimes tearing it apart and then piecing it back together again. So in this case, I commissioned pure uh, white strips in the studio and then I cut them apart into these heartbreaking things because we'd worked so long on these perfect strips. And then we sewed them back together with this blue thread. And, uh, we probably worked on this for eight months. Back to the grid. And back to this study of the human hand where, you know, again, this is an identical white that is, is taking on these different colors and shades based on the people that I work with, just based on the human hand. This is a Zulu love letter. Um, just kind of writing to the team, writing to them. Sometimes we have these little discarded pieces and I, 
I like sort of the language. I like this idea of language, a, a visual language that sometimes can say more than words. This is um, called Gather One Million. It's a, a sculpture that I guess, I guess, you know, I was kind of showing you images that were sort of slightly dystopic earlier, you know, like um, the, the noose and the bucket and this thing. I think something happened to me when I was in South Africa. I really tapped into joy and suffering in equal measure. Um, and I, this, is a, this is a really a work that's about harvest. It's about the harvest of labor, I think. Um, these are uh, one million blades of grass. So in the, in the backyard, it was only a quarter of a million in the backyard. So this was a, 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 a project where we worked on the making of these blades of grass for, I think, about three years. And then I bundled them and weighed them in, uh, there's 202 blades of grass in each bundle that you're seeing. And then the bundle goes across 77, uh, and there's 77 bundles by 77. Um, what really fascinates me here is that in the middle of it, you're never going to see that I really did that. I could be cheating. And I love that again, this idea that, that labor is unsung, that it's in there, it's implicit, it's, it's kind of radioactive. But you actually can never take it in fully or appreciate it. There's this really amazing um, gospel song that the team often sing, and it's, um, how does it go? Um, it's, you don't know, um, I'll think of it in a minute, but it's, we sing it a lot in the studio. For some reason, I'm drawing a blank on you. But it's really about, you don't know me. No, 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 you don't know me. And I, I, think, I think that's implicit in the work, implicit in working with people who are used to being ignored. Um, I, I think someone once saw my work and said, but will there be text so that people can know about the women in the work? And again, it goes back to this idea that I think the work should sing on its own without having to hear the whole story about how it was made. But hopefully, that's why it feels a little disingenuous to give an artist talk, you know? Because um, I, what I think about it probably doesn't really matter to you. You should just have your own feelings. And here's the joy, you know? Just the kind of wonder and joy that's there. And actually, in this particular picture, they're celebrating because we had just finished a project that you'll see on the wall that I'm gonna show you in a second. This was an interesting moment for me. Um, I commissioned a, a, a strip made of this canvas-colored bead, and, 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 and it came back, and I was so amazed at how much variation there was in something that was so repetitive that was one color. I was astonished by this. I looked at that and said, oh my god, that's the most amazing painting. That's a painting. And I suddenly thought, this is my work. This is it. This is the show. So, um, and I also liked it that it's slightly, it's not razzle-dazzle, it's, it's so subtle, it's so quiet, and yet there's a monument in that. 30 people, close to 30 people, I think, um, we, we start, actually, I should tell you, my studio team, we had at one point 31 people, but a few people have passed away, so now we have 27 people. Um, so I can't tell you exactly how many people on this particular painting, but it was, and I'm gonna call it a painting, even though it isn't a painting, it's a sculpture, right? But I thought about, and so I made it kind of an environment, a room, because I love this thing of repeating and repeating and repeating something that could be considered dull. To me, it isn't dull at all, but if you watched us doing it, you probably would get bored. It's very, very slow and painstaking, yet I get astonished by this kind of sp splendor of the hand. This is a project that I did. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing to show you because um, I had a gallery show of this, but tech, but there, there's not for sale. It's um, this this room is something I want to keep because I want to keep them together. So I saw this. I did a show at White Cube, and I saw it as a kind of installation, even though you could read it as individual paintings. Um, but I love this gray room because there's this kind of um, taking away color where you really see the hand and the form. And you kind of see, if you really look, I think there's a little button I can show you. See this little strip right here? That's um, a particular woman that I work with named Fakile, who always makes this little mountain shape. So I call that Fakile's mountain. So um, they're in every one of our um, uh, works here. You'll see them. But they're, it's, it's a one bead that's made in Japan. It's an identical bead, and yet this variation occurs just based on the sweat of the hand, just based on making. And I'm really, really so interested in that. I almost feel like a scientist of the hand. And then I did a series of um, exploring color. 
and divides. So the show was called Solid Divide. And thinking about landscape and sunrise and this kind of idea of one, one side would have this um, very shiny top, uh, top or bottom and the bottom would be very matte or the other way around. And also this idea of perfectionism versus when things go wrong. So here you see the black on the top is this kind of perfection, doesn't show the mistakes. But of course the mistakes are, what are so, what's so wonderful to me anyway. Let's see if I can go forward here. Did, wait a second. So the way these are made is um, each one is made on a strip. And the strips are made, and you see Fakile's Mountain there. Um, they're made at home in the townships, and then these strips are brought together in my studio where I piece them together to make, make a hole. I think of them kind of almost as bandages. And here's more. Another divide. Um, You know, you have to have gold in there. I mean, the thing is, is that my material is, they're beads, man, you know? They shine. And, and it's kind of cool to get to, um, to, to get into that a little bit and, you know, not kind of be afraid of, of that. I think I spent a lot of time after the kitchen in the backyard and those early works that are so kind of visually kind of saturated, um, sort of trying to tone it down. But it's, it's lovely to come home to, to color. Speaking of which, um, you see in the corner here, this is a piece called Color Field, and it's a 1,200 square foot floor sculpture. It's kind of go circling back to the backyard and thinking about grass and circling back to gather one million, only now looking at it as a grid. And it has this moire effect as you walk through, and I got very interested in, in color relationships. So it's a painting that you can't walk on, but you can walk around, and it changes um, as you walk around it. But I guess I should also mention that um, 500 people helped me install this. Um, so I worked with my studio team to make the grass over a four-year period, um, and, and then to install it at the Neuberger Museum, upstate New York, this last um, fall, we had 500 volunteers. Because what it is, is it's, um, you know, I actually don't know how, even how many blades of grass this is, but what we had, it, it's these little um, trays that I have here that he's holding. And it's a pre-drilled tray. And then this lovely lady here is putting the grass there. And she's putting it each one into these holes. And like this. And then we take these, these trays. And this is my plan, my handy dandy plan. And you see these, there's grass. He shows what color it is. And then, oh then, I place them on the floor. And it makes this kind of painting. I like this kind of juiciness of looking. You know, I think about it a lot. I think about what things look like. I think it matters. And I also think it's interesting how things are made, that side of things too. But in the end, the pleasure of looking is something that shouldn't be underestimated. I guess I was thinking a bit about Richter and Ellsworth Kelly in those pieces where um, Ellsworth Kelly did a piece of just random um, squares. And I thought about that, having the public just piece it together and putting them down. And I tried that as an experiment, what would happen if the public made, put the trays together and then also put them together. But what I found was it, it wouldn't be a painting. It wouldn't be, you know, there's something about these relationships and being really conscious about where it goes is really central. And I think that's true of all my work when I work with other people. Um, is that there's this overarching kind of feel like I'm a choreographer where I'm definitely um, thinking very deeply about where and how things will go. At the same time, releasing control and being open to, to mistakes and changes that can inspire the work. Which leads to this work. This body of work is called Iklube, which is Isizulu for random. And what they are is um, each one of these is a, is a palette that I've mixed together, handed out to my studio team, and then each strip comes back differently and then I piece them together to make a painting. And it's all based on preference. People have preferences over the color green, for example. Some people you'll see in these strips don't like the color blue. Um, and so this kind of random process that's happening is totally random. I'm not in control of every square inch. And, and yet I am with what happens. The palette is completely um, devised by me. I commissioned the beads in Japan. So there's this control, lack of control, control, and it's a really interesting relationship to making. And this is um, the most recent work um, that I just closed in Salzburg. 
uh, at uh, today's Road Pack, and it's a show called The Waves. And um, it's a, a project that um, looking at, again, looking at color, but now getting into this idea of what happens with shine, what happens with the kind of moire effect on a painting. You can see in the background that gray canvas and the blue, it really changes based on the light. It's almost like a living painting. And that's exciting to me, because paint doesn't do that. So I'm always interested in that kind of Frank Stella thing where he said in the 60s about his paintings, you know, I want the paint to look as good as it did in the can. Well, I want these to look better than they do in the can. And so if any of you are wearing beads, you better give it up because I'm going to take them off you. Because I feel like I'm the one who knows what to do with them. It's really arrogant. <laughs> but I've worked a long time, so, you know, I especially feel like that when I'm working with the factories, you know, with the beads, like Willy Wonka. But I love these um, differentials that occur, this the subtlety of the human hand, how the human hand incurs itself. It's like an incursion of the hand. It's not done willfully. These streaks that you see are not done with, with, with someone trying to be creative. And I have to say, I've always been very suspicious of creativity, especially after the early work. I'm suspicious of my own creativity. I have a tendency to kind of be, go, go, f go crazy. So I like to I, have to, I feel very controlled here. I'm kind of controlling myself, controlling the material, trying to let the material speak louder, trying to let the material do what it wants to do, and even working with other people, do what they do best. The people that I work with weave better than anybody. They're, the, they're master weavers, so I work with that. I say, okay, you, kind of, you know how to weave? Honey, come over here, let's do this. And that that's feels like what I'm, what I'm interested in doing, exploring, that every person I work with, I know their hands. I know who's good at what. So again, Ficule's Mountain, if you can find it there. And this is the last thing I'll show you. This, is, um, this was also part of my show um, uh, with, uh, in, in Salzburg, and it's called The Waves. And it's 1,000 cloths. Each one of these are woven to a specific um, specification. And um, I thought about this as a room environment. And so you walk through these rooms. And again, I look at this and I see the kitchen still. I see the, I see the grid. I see the human hand. It even has a kind of domestic quality in the sense that these could be house cloths. If you didn't know or didn't care, which often people look at work and it just passes their retinal vision and they don't look at it, you wouldn't know what it's made of. You wouldn't know that it was. we did this over years and years and years. And so each, I think of each cloth as a painting, as an abstract painting as a kind of monument, a kind of accidental monument, because no one creatively said, I know what, I'm going to make a streak right there. And yet there it is. And so it's six rooms, and you walk through it. And again, it's not a commercial project. Um, it's something that I want to keep the thousand class intact. Um, maybe I'll make more, I don't know. We'll see. It's kind of... Because I was going to try to make 10,000, but whoa. Um, there's actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with a little thing, if I can find it here. It's uh, Virginia Woolf. It's, it's from the waves. So she wrote this. She said, The sun had not yet risen. The sea was indistinguishable from the sky, except that the sea was slightly creased, as if a cloth had wrinkles in it. Gradually, as the sky whitened, a dark line lay at the horizon, dividing the sea from the sky, and the gray cloth became barred with thick strokes, moving one after another, beneath the surface, following each other, pursuing each other perpetually. And I'll end here. This is, people ask me, what are you doing now? And I'm doing a lot of drawing. So that's it. Thanks so much. So I don't think we have time for questions. We have time for questions. Yeah, we do. Oh, we do? So, let's see, Sean. I know some of you are students and you want to go back to your workshop, so please feel free to do that. And, uh, and then we'll take some questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring you a microphone. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. I'm Nancy, and I have watched your work grow. I've seen many of them in person, and I just want to applaud you. Oh, thanks. Um, Thank you. I, I also want to ask you, what, did you make the structures of the people that you beaded? Yes. What are they made out of? Fiberglass. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I've, I've Thank you. I've started watching you from the presidents when you were here in Aspen. Oh, really? Oh. And I've seen you all the way through, and we just saw the piece in Westchester. Oh, great. Totally random. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Is there a question here? Okay. Hi. I'm interested how in how you went from making the kitchen in the 90s, kind of pre-internet, to then being represented by galleries and museums, like it will especially to find people who accepted it as painting. Can you rephrase that? I'm not sure I know well, your question. I read this, I'm sorry. Um, I read this article about you where it said you had sent a postcard to um, the director of the new museum, so I yeah. didn't know, <clears throat> was it your Right, yeah, I didn't hustle? send an email, right. So was it your hustle that got exposure for your work, or was it you just making the work and... Um, kind of people coming, to, approaching you to represent the work or museum shows or that kind of thing. That's Especially okay. pre-internet where yeah. there weren't blogs or right. that type of thing. Instagram. I'm just interested in that transition yeah. from you as a 20 year old to yeah. your a little career old lady. now. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, you know, it's kind of a, a, a big, um, long, boring story, but I'll try and make it short. Um, because when I made the kitchen, I was very far outside any kind of art world, you know, or idea of that I was going to meet anybody or schmooze with anybody or anyone was going to come by the studio. That didn't happen. I had day jobs to support the work. I worked at night. Um, I waitressed. I, smol I sold prom dresses. Um, and then at night, I had this, this thing I was doing. And, you know, just that alone, how do you make something really big? How do you find the space for it? You know, I, I did it, started in my apartment. I had a little kitchen, a little counter that I would do things, objects. And, lost deposits because the glue would glop everywhere. So at a certain point, um, while um, when I f sort of quasi finished with the piece, I had a friend who was a graduate student at Cal State Fullerton, which is outside LA. And she was just graduating, and she was graduating in museum studies. And I don't re quite remember. I had made small objects, actually, out of the kitchen. That was one of the things I started to do to support my, my work. I just made like soup cans and, and, and cups and saucers and spoons. I just met. You know, I see, saw someone here who has one of my early small, small things that I made out of the kitchen in order to support it. I would sell it. So anyway, this friend of mine I was having was graduating from Cal State Fullerton, and she said, hey, there's a graduate student um, gallery. Maybe I could get them to let you show the kitchen, you know? Even, you know we, and I said, yeah, okay, well, let's call it kitchenette because it's not finished yet. Cool, you know, because you have to realize, you know, I didn't go to school. So for me, that was like, wow, you know, Kawabunga, you know, a show in a graduate school, you know, gallery, teeny, teeny graduate school gallery. And most of you who have MFAs know what I'm talking about. So, whoa, we put the kitchen in there, and it got all this crazy, crazy press. And, um, it, and I, think, I think what I have to say or what I learned from that is just, like, do the work. Just do the work anywhere that you show it. Can, something can happen. You just don't know. Do the work, and there's no place too small to show your work either. There's no, you know, no holding out for like the big moment. Just show it. Someone wants to show it. Hey, okay, yeah, I'll show it. So um, when that finished, I had enough money to make a color postcard. You know, I, it was before you can make them really cheaply now. So I had to like huff to it. And I think it cost like 500 bucks or something. And I had a friend do the thing. And there's a picture of the kitchen, and I sent out that postcard to various people that I liked in the art world. Thought, oh, you know, just send a postcard. But you know about that, right? That that goes through a slush pile, a lonely postcard, no letter. And I sent it to lots of people, and I also sent it to the new museum. I sent it to Marsha Tucker, who's the curator and the director there. And she called me from home and said, oh my god, you know, this is amazing. Um, I want to show this. I'm doing a group show. And that was it for me. That, was, that, was, um, that went into a group show with 50 other artists. And it got a lot of uh, people um, saw it. And um, that was in 1996. So, um, and then I started to have shows. So it was a little bit of, you know, when you ask what, what kind of elbow grease did I have to do? Well, I had to do everything. I mean, when the graduate show happened, I, you know, nobody was doing anything for, you know what I mean? There was no administrative anything. It was just the, myself doing stuff, printing out that card that I had printed, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's a good question, because it has changed now about how you, how you get your work in the world. But if it can work for me, and a Luddite who can send out a postcard, what can you do now with the internet, you know? So it's, it's changed. Maybe it's easier. I don't think it is. I think it's just as hard. Anyway, sorry, it's a long answer. Are we done? Is it over? Can we go eat? <laughs>
Thank you so much. Liza, I think that was way beyond almost wonderful. I think it was very wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs>